Hello and welcome to the six easy steps to ABG analysis. In this program, we are going to go through the normal values for blood gases, abnormal values, and interpret some blood gases to give you some practice with the major components of an arterial blood gas. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So the six steps to ABG analysis are, one, we're going to look at the pH, then we're going to look at the CO2, the bicarb, and onward. Notice that there's two main components that we are assessing when we look at a blood gas. We're assessing both the pH, which tells us about acid-base balance, and we're going to assess the oxygenation status of our patient. So two different areas of information that we're getting from arterial blood gases. So the arterial blood gas was drawn from the patient. Now we're going to take a look at the results and try to determine what we can find out about both the acid-base balance and about the oxygenation for this patient. The first step is to look at the pH. When we look at our arterial blood gases and our components, we don't want to talk about these values in terms of them being high or low. Instead, we want to talk about them in terms of being normal, acidotic, or alkalotic. So let's take a look at the first step. We ask, is the pH normal, acidotic, or alkalotic? Step number two, we ask, is the CO2 normal, acidotic, or alkalotic? In step number three, we're going to ask, is the bicarb normal, acidotic, or alkalotic? Next, we're going to look at the CO2 and the bicarb and determine which one of those matches the pH. So in other words, we're looking for the ones that have the same interpretation. If the pH was acidotic and the bicarb is acidotic, those are the two that match. After we've made that determination, and by the way, that tells us about the primary imbalance that our patient has, next we move on and we look at the CO2 and bicarb to see if one goes the opposite direction. If one goes in the opposite direction, that is called compensation. So we're going to assess that too. Then lastly, we look at the PO2 and the O2 saturation to help to tell us about the patient's oxygenation. Now, I briefly mentioned this concept of compensation. What compensation refers to is that the body wants to maintain a pH of 7.40 all the time. So we want to have this normal pH floating around in the bloodstream. We don't want our pH to be high or low. So if something happens, for example, if the lungs are causing this CO2 to become low, then the kidneys are going to have to kick in as a compensatory mechanism and try to balance out our pH. So there's a normal balancing act that's occurring here between the lung and the kidney all the time in order to maintain a normal pH. Our compensation by the lung, as you may imagine, could be very rapid. All you have to do is breathe faster or breathe slower to get rid of more CO2 or to retain more CO2. On the other hand, the bicarb is a little bit more difficult because in order to maintain, uh, a, to, to change our bicarb, we're going to have to either retain more bicarb by the kidney or we're going to have to dump off more hydrogen ions. So we need to have some time in order to do that. It takes about 8 to 24 hours to get compensation out of the kidney, whereas it can take just a matter of minutes to get compensation out of the lung. Now here's the normal values we see on our arterial blood gas. A pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Notice that very tight range right around 7.4. By the way, as you're looking at lab values, just in general, the wider the range is, the more likely it is the patient can tolerate being outside the range. The more narrow the range is, the less likely the patient can tolerate being outside the range. So for example, in this case, 7.35 to 7.45, we could have somebody who's at a 7.3. Okay, they're only five hundredths out of the range, yet they could be very symptomatic. On the other hand, look at the CO2. CO2 is 35 to 45. You might be able to remember this easily by just remembering it's the same last two numbers as the pH. But the CO2 is normal range is, seven, is 35 to 45. So somebody who has a CO2 of 30 is probably not going to be very symptomatic because there is such a wide range in the CO2. You see the difference between those? The tighter the range, the more likely somebody's going to be symptomatic, even with a little bit of a, a difference. But the wider the range, the less likely the patient's going to have symptoms with just a tiny little change in the range. PO2 normal is 80 to 100. Okay, PO2 is the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the blood. Right? It's not what you get on a pulse ox. And then your bicarb normal is 22 to 26. Our oxygen saturation normal is going to be 95 to 100 percent. 
So here's what happens when the values become abnormal. If our pH is less than 7.35, the patient would develop acidosis. If the pH is greater than 7.45, we have alkalosis. If your patient has a CO2 less than 35, they have alkalosis, and greater than 45, they have acidosis. Hmm, this is interesting, isn't it? When you take a look at these values right here, you'll notice that the CO2 goes the opposite direction of the pH. This is why we don't want to talk about values being high or low, but we want to make the interpretation of the value instead. One way to remember this relationship between our CO2 and our bicarbon, our pH, is to remember the acronym ROME, R-O-M-E. ROME stands for Respiratory Opposite Metabolic Equal. Respiratory Opposite Metabolic Equal. So the respiratory is opposite of the pH. The metabolic system, the bicarb, is equal. It does the same thing. In other words, when the bicarb is less than 22, we have acidosis. Greater than 26, we have alkalosis. When our PO2 is less than 80, we have hypoxemia. Greater than 100 only happens when somebody is on oxygen therapy. So we're going to anticipate that the person is on oxygen therapy if our O2 is greater than 100. Oxygen saturation less than 95% indicates hypoxemia. And of course, you can't have a higher than 100% oxygen saturation. Here are the normal values again. And if you'd like to stop the video at this point just to have the normal values up on your screen, you can do so. And then use the Six Easy Steps to ABG Analysis ebook to be able to answer the questions, the scenarios that are listed in there. We're going to practice a scenario here in just a moment, but these normal values may help you in order to interpret the values that are in the ebook. Well, hopefully you got some value out of looking at those values and uh, interpreting them with the ebook. But I would also like to talk to you about a couple more components that we see with an arterial blood gas. So the blood gas may be drawn, and it comes back, and you notice at the bottom of the blood gas it has a BE, and BE stands for base excess. This gives us an idea of the magnitude of the metabolic component of our acid base imbalance. What it does is it measures the base excess, measures the total amount of body bases that we have in the body. Okay, so it measures hemoglobin, phosphates, sulfates, chloride, albumin. Those are all buffers in the body that buffer acid. So the base excess monitors and it assesses these. Normal is going to be about plus 2 to, to minus 2. So you notice it's a very tight little range right around zero. So we shouldn't have an excess of base. We should have just the right amount of base because base is going to absorb or cancel out our acid. So we don't want to have too much or we would have an alkalotic situation going on in a patient. So instead we want to have the right amount of base. Okay, well what happens then if a patient has an abnormal base excess? So let's say for example that you get back this blood gas result and you find out that the patient has a base excess of minus 10. Okay, this is kind of like a double negative, which gets a little confusing, but a base excess of minus 10, which means we have a negative amount of excess. It's kind of like a double negative, isn't it? Which in, it means instead that we have acidosis. So if we have a negative number, it's acidotic, a positive number, it's alkalotic. The bigger the number gets, the more of an acid-base imbalance we have in our patient. And this tells you about the metabolic component. It doesn't tell you about respiratory. It tells you about what the metabolic component is doing. A metabolic acidosis can come from a variety of different factors. It could be from shock. It could be from diabetic ketoacidosis. It could be from poisonings or taking different drugs. So there's a lot of things that can cause a metabolic acidosis. Many of our patients in the hospital, especially those in critical care units, have multiple things going on with them. For that reason, we may have to try to differentiate between a number of different things that could be causing a patient to have a metabolic acidosis. That's where we would look at an anion gap. An anion gap looks at our positive ions, which is going to be sodium and potassium, so the primary positive ions, and the primary negative ions, which are chloride and bicarb. So we're going to look at these in relationship to each other, and then we can determine whether or not there's a normal ratio between these two, or a high ratio or a low ratio between the positive and the negative ions in the body. And this can help us to be able to determine the source of a metabolic acidosis.
So let's take a look at an example here of an arterial blood gas. Here we have Mr. Pina. He's 72 years old. He has a diagnosis of congestive heart failure. His history is heart failure, renal failure, hypertension, found this morning in a full cardiopulmonary arrest. So they take a blood gas on him. They find that his pH is 6.98. He has a CO2 of 62, bicarb of 14, PO2 of 80, oxygen saturation 89%, base access minus 11, and an anion gap of 18. So let's go through each one of those values and talk about what they mean. So following the six easy steps to ABG analysis, we first look at the pH, and we ask, is the pH normal, acidotic, or alkalotic? And in fact, this pH is very low, which means it's acidotic. So we have a severe acidosis going on here. So where's that acidosis coming from? Well, let's take a look at our CO2 and our bicarb. Our CO2 is high. Our CO2 is elevated at 62. A normal value is 35 to 45. An elevated CO2 indicates that our patient has an acidosis. All right now, let's look at the bicarb. Bicarb of 14. Decrease in our bicarb also indicates an acidosis. So what we have going on here is we have both a respiratory and a metabolic acidosis occurring in our patient. And that's why the pH is so terribly low, because we have a combined acidosis. All right, now, does that make sense when you go back and look at the scenario? The patient was found in a full cardiopulmonary arrest. So they're in shock. They're not having good perfusion. We would anticipate a metabolic acidosis. At the same time, the patient also isn't breathing very well. Therefore, we'd anticipate a respiratory acidosis. So it makes sense that both of these things are combined. Next, we have a PO2 of 80 and an oxygen saturation of 89%. Now, a PO2 of 80 is, is normal. It's in the lower end of the normal range, but it is normal, right? Oxygen saturation of 89% is certainly less than the 95% we would expect to find. Now, if either one of these values is low, the PO2 or the O2 saturation, we call it hypoxemia. So they don't both have to be low. In order to call it hypoxemia, one of the values or the other being low, we call it hypoxemia. So this patient has both a metabolic and a respiratory acidosis with hypoxemia. Next, we look at the next two values. Our base excess of minus 11 indicates that we have a severe metabolic acidosis. So a great proportion of this acidosis is coming from the metabolic system. So you go back up to the top part of your screen there, and you're looking at the CO2 and the bicarb, and you think, well, we have both an acidosis coming from the lung and from the metabolic system. Which one is causing the biggest problem? Well, right now, it kind of looks like the metabolic system is contributing at least a big factor to this acidosis. Lastly, we look at the anion gap. Anion gap of 18 is above the normal range, and that would indicate that the patient has a metabolic acidosis caused by shock. Well, thank you for using the six easy steps to ABG analysis. Hopefully, you've had an opportunity to download the ebook and do the examples in the ebook that will certainly help you to be able to understand arterial blood gases. The more practice you get with them, the easier they get, and the more you will understand how to implement these in practice. Thanks for joining me this time. Until next time, bye now.